when we were given the signal to open fire, I held on to that trigger and the 240 just came to life beautifully. It did not jam once. And once I started firing, I started my watch and I was determined to hold on to that trigger for no less than 30 seconds. When we hit the, when we hit the 30 second mark, I let go of the trigger for about three seconds. And then I fired again and I kept firing at a rapid rate until the squad leader ran over to us to tell us to stop firing. I looked at the barrel through my night vision and it was glowing. Welcome back to my Ranger School adventure where I am going through every day of my journey through the U.S. Army's Ranger School. In the last video, which you can see up here, I went through my first graded patrol and talked about how I got a passing grade. In this video, I'm going to go through a few stories from the Darby phase to give you an idea about what life is like when you're out in the patrolling lanes and when you're back at the camp. In the next video, we're going to close out Darby phase by talking about my last patrol and about what happens when you find out that you passed. Then in the next videos, we'll move on to the mountain phase, which we'll actually cover every single day, because as a reminder, here in the Darby phase, every day is basically the same. It's the same thing over and over with very little variance. So rather than go through every single day, which would just be really boring, I've highlighted what I think are the best and most interesting stories. <clears throat> If you want to skip ahead a little bit to the Florida phase, uh, you can click the link below in the description to read or you can listen to one of my free newsletters where I talk pretty in depth about the planning and preparation for the Santa Rosa mission, which is in the Florida phase, which is known as the final exam of Ranger School. It contains what I think is a really solid tip to executing uh, patrol based operations, which is something that you're going to do a lot at Ranger School. Most stories and, and tips that you're going to hear about patrol bases are about setup and occupation, but this one is actually how you use the patrol base in the morning when you wake up to prepare for the day's mission. I think you'll really like it. Okay, now on to the Darby phase. Okay, so this story I called Vietnam. Every day so far in Darby, we had to cross Hollis Creek and we were getting tired of getting wet. Soon after we crossed the creek, it would always get dark and we would get extremely cold and uncomfortable because we never had the opportunity to change our boots. During the planning phase for this mission, we determined to find a place in the creek where we could cross without getting wet, or at least not get as wet as we had been getting. We looked at the map and thought what we found was the ideal crossing point, but we had to go several hundred meters out of the way. Oh, how wrong we were. We set out from the detrucking point towards the creek. The brush was thick and our movement was really slow. I started getting into shallow mud and then deeper mud. I thought that it was muddy because we had found a place where the stream was really wide and so just not deep. But it was, you know, hopefully it was just much shallower. We kept on going on our planned route, but I quickly realized that our terrain analysis had been way off. The stream was deep, deeper than we had seen it at any other point. We kept looking for a shallow place to cross. The squad leader, Billy, was getting frustrated because we were running low on time and I knew he wanted to get across the creek. Billy was a tall, confident West Point graduate that had recycled Darby and was on his second try. Now, I'm not sure what, what Billy uh, had told the point man, but we just headed straight through that creek. I didn't know how bad it was until I saw Billy up to his armpits in water. He looked back at me with this huge grin and just said, man, screw this. The reason I was so close to Billy was that I had volunteered to carry the 240 machine gun as I did almost every day in Darby if I was not in a leadership position. I smiled back at Billy and I put the 240 up on my shoulders and waded into the water. I honestly felt like the biggest badass in the world. I felt like one of those guys you would see in like a Vietnam War movie. Wading into that dirty water was so miserable we couldn't help but laugh. The irony of the fact that we had set out that morning to find the best possible crossing point and found possibly the worst crossing point only added to the humor of the situation. Now, we were completely soaked by the time we got to the other side, and night was falling on us fast. 
Most in the squad did not share the lightheartedness. Billy and I had uh, had found that we could just laugh at this situation, but most people found that it was just too miserable to laugh at. But my feelings of badassery did not last very long. It got dark fast, and we started to get really cold. As long as we were moving, we were fine. It was when we stopped that the cold really got us. We completed the mission successfully and headed for the link-up point. Once we got there, we waited and waited and waited, and that was one of the most miserable times at Ranger School. We were doing our best to huddle up with our buddies while still pulling security, but the wind was blowing and chilling us to the bone. I came really close to tears, just lying there on the cold ground watching the road, begging God to just let the truck show up and let us get back to Darby. We were soaked to the bone and freezing, and we were all shaking uncontrollably. I'm really surprised nobody got hypothermia. After what felt like over an hour of pure misery, the truck finally showed up. We loaded up and headed back. This this little section here is about wearing your poly pro, which is your long underwear. So every night when we got back to Darby, the first thing we hoped for was the order to put on our long underwear. Students are not allowed to alter the uniform until told to do so by the cadre. And there's good reason for this, especially when you get up to mountains. You do not want ranger students putting on a whole bunch of warm clothes and then putting on their ruck and then moving out because they're going to sweat a lot. Uh, and when they sweat, obviously their clothes are going to get wet and they're going to be a lot colder. Now, I know you're going to get wet going through the creek anyway. And at Darby, because missions are only one day long, you go out on your mission, you come back and you sleep at your little sleeping station at the camp, at the at the overhang. Um, you still want to train students to make sure that they're always following the uniform. Because when you get out to mountain phase, you're actually sleeping out on the patrolling lanes. You're going out and you're going to stay out for several days before you come back for for refit whereas at darby you're coming back every day i remember standing on the rocks by the cadre building every night wondering when will they let us put on our poly pro we were like pavlovian dogs we always pulled out our poly pro and shivered over it knowing how much warmer we would be if only we could put it on so we'd pull it out of our rucksack we'd put it on top and just stare at it and just be like oh god when are they gonna let us put this on because we're just shaking and freezing a cadre member would walk out of the building and we were on pins and needles hoping he would say okay put your snivel gear on which is what we call it we call it snivel gear when we were finally told to snivel up we stripped off our acu tops and tan t-shirts as fast as our, our wind burned fingers would let us it was like our acu tops were on fire and we just couldn't get them off fast enough and we would throw on our long underwear and put our uniform back on uh, it probably looked completely pathetic but if you go in the winter, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a summer ranger, you will not get the joy of having to stare at your poly pro waiting to be told to put it, put it on. All right. This story is about when we got back from a mission and an MRE went missing. Now, if there's one thing that I can tell you about Darby, it's that you do not want to lose track of one of your MREs. And for my civilian audience, an MRE is a meal ready to eat. It's a meal that comes in a, a little brown package, and it's got about 1,800 to 2,000 calories in it. It's it's a pretty impressive piece of technology. But at Ranger School, you, they very tightly control how much you eat, so you don't want to lose one of those things, and you'll find out why. We peered three people in Darby. I don't think it's statistically possible to peer anymore, and we wouldn't have wanted to. Just to backtrack for a second, at the end of every phase, students fill out peer evaluation forms on each person in their squad. On the forms, each person answers questions about their squad mates' initiative, physical stamina, leadership, and several other factors. You also have to answer questions like, would you go to war with this person, or would you share a foxhole with this person? You also rank each of the people. In a 16-person squad, you have to rank each person 1 to 15. You don't rank yourself, and you can't give two people the same numerical ranking. In some formula they use, if a student gets lower than a 60%, uh, 
uh, that student has to go to the board to find out whether or not he or she will be allowed to advance to the next phase. Of the three people in our squad who received a rank lower than 60, two were dropped from the course and one, his name was Bennett, was allowed to advance to mountains. I was never concerned about my peer evaluations in Darby because I had really good relationships with the guys in my squad and I knew I was pulling more than my share of my weight. I mean, I carried the 240 machine gun every day. That was like my shtick. If I wasn't a team leader or a squad leader, I carried the machine gun and that was good enough to get me through Darby. Anyway. One night we came back from a mission and this guy's name was Brown, who was one of the guys we ended up peering out, could not find his MRE. Now, we were convinced, based on his clumsiness and lack of personal discipline, that he had lost it. Nonetheless, we offered him bits and pieces of our food, which is quite a large sacrifice considering how little food that we were given. He refused electing instead to go to the cadre building and ask for a replacement. We all advised against this and told him we would help him out, but he refused and trekked up to the cadre building. He returned, not surprisingly, empty-handed. Sergeant First Class Fernandez, who was one of the more reasonable ranger instructors, came down to our hooch about 30 minutes later. As it turns out, Brown had told him that someone had stolen his MRE. Sergeant First Class Fernandez was furious because he obviously hates stealing. He gave us a stern look and offered immunity to the person who stole it. No one came forward. He then made the whole squad dump out our rucksacks, and he went through each one very meticulously. I piped up and said, if someone stole it, surely they're not stupid enough to keep it in their ruck. They would just hide it in the woods and eat after everyone went to bed. Sergeant first, Sergeant first Class Fernandez looked at me quizzically. I kicked myself for opening my big fat mouth. A very bad habit I have, especially at the worst times. I tried to recover saying, gotta think like a thief to catch a thief, right, Sergeant? He just kept on searching. He said, I'm going to go call the commander. I don't know what he's going to say. By the time I get back, the MRE better be found. We all wished that we had not already eaten our MREs so we could just show him one when he got back and say that we found it, which is what he hinted that he wanted to happen. <laughs> we, went, we went to the other squad's planning bays and asked them if they had any extras. No luck. Sergeant First Class Fernandez came back and asked if it had been found. We shamefully, shamefully replied in the negative. Brown piped up, Sergeant, um, uh, I ate the MRE when I was on security during the mission. Oh, my God. And remember how I said that I always speak up at the wrong time? This was one of those times. I didn't really like Brown, but I did feel sorry for him because he was really young. I mean, really young. I was 20 years old and this kid was 18. So I guess really young. There you go. And I think he Brown wanted to do good. He was just pretty inexperienced. Again, I've been in the army for like 20 weeks and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's young and inexperienced. <laughs> now, I don't know why I did it, but I said, Brown, don't try to lie to get us out of this. I knew he was lying. I should have just let him lie and get kicked out of the course. It would have saved everyone a lot of misery that night. Sergeant First Class Fernandez asked Brown if he actually did eat it. And Brown hung his head and admitted that he had not eaten his MRE. <laughs> Sergeant First Class Fernandez then called for every squad in the company to make a mass formation. It was already 0245 in the morning, and we were pissed. We could only think of one thing, which was sleep. Sergeant First Class Fernandez gave the whole company a speech about how much he hated thievery. He said we could stand there until someone fessed up and the MRE was found. After he left, the mob mentality began to take over. No one really blamed an unknown thief. They blamed the person who went to the cadre about it. No one outside of the squad knew it was Brown, and no one in the squad told the crowd who it was. Each person in the mob was angry about one of three things. The first group was on a witch hunt to find the thief, which was obviously impossible because this dude definitely lost his MRE. The second group was angry at the moron stupid enough to either lose it or leave it unsecured so that a thief at the correct opportunity could steal it. 
The third group, of which I was a part, was angry that this issue was taken to the cadre and not kept in-house. It was clear that we were not being punished by the cadre for the thief who supposedly stole the MRE. They were punishing us for not working together as a team to resolve the issue instead of bringing it to them. Now, I was lucky enough to be standing next to Brown, who was panicking, afraid that someone in the squad would finger him as the culprit for making everyone stay up late in the cold. I turned and tried to point out to him the obvious fact that he was going to get peered out. I said, Brown, we still have almost a week of this phase left. Why are you going to put yourself through a week of misery when you know that we're going to peer you out at the end? Just go up there and LOM, which is which that stands for lack of motivation. It is Ranger speak for quit. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just pointing out the obvious, which is what I told him. And he, he just, his eyes teared up. He sort of half wondered and he was just like, F you, man. <laughs> like, sorry, man. I mean, it's obvious. Just trying to save you some misery. I already stupidly saved him from getting kicked out of the course. I didn't even dislike him. I just knew he wasn't ready for this course. Anyway, I mean, looking back, it was really mean. I mean, you know, 20 year old, young Brand new officers are going to say some mean things, especially it's two forty five in the morning. I haven't eaten in several. I've been eating a real meal and, you know, well over a week at this point. Give me a break. <laughs> anyway, it was almost four in the morning when we were finally told to go to bed. And mind you, we have to wake up at like five. So had it not been for Brown, we would have gotten a solid two hours of sleep. But because of him, we only got about forty five minutes just to clear up any confusion, the Brown in my squad was not my good friend, Matt Brown, who we talked about in one of the other videos. It's not the same guy, completely different guy. All right. One of the other guys we peered out, whose name I don't remember, was a chow thief. He did steal food from the chow hall all the time, which wasn't that bad because he was only increasing his chow and not costing anyone else their chow. The reason he was a chow thief was because we caught him multiple times trying to switch his MRE with those of others. At the beginning of the day, the Bravo team leader would go up to the cadre building and pick up all the supplies that we were going to need for that day, including the MREs. He would then come down and put two random MREs by each rucksack. This was to avoid the everyone trying to jump into the MRE box and grab the one that they wanted. So we just did it by random. It's like, you get the MREs that you get, man. And if you want to go around, if you want to trade with somebody, fine. But like, we're not doing the song and dance of trying to jump in and grab the MRE that you want. So we just passed them out. Whoever was the Bravo team leader, two random MREs by your rucksack. And that's what you get. At the beginning of the phase, some people were getting angry because they would be happy with MREs that they got. But then they would return to find out that they now had a different MRE and usually a crappy MRE. And as everyone who eats these things knows, there are good ones and not so good ones. Although I will say that over time, and this is in 2012 when all this is happening, the MREs were a lot, not a lot different. They've gotten a, they've gotten a lot better over the last decade or so. All MREs now are all pretty good. I haven't had a bad one in a long time. So, but back then, so you'd get your MREs and you'd be like, oh, beef stew or whatever. That's a pretty good one. I like that. But then you'd come back and it'd be like egg omelet. And you're like, what? <laughs> How did I get, I had, I had uh, beef stew. How did egg, egg omelet come from? And this kept happening. So as it turns out, this guy had been making switches. This guy Bennett had been making switches almost every single day. And he was useless during the planning phase. He was useless as a team leader, and he was unreliable as just a regular soldier. And he never helped gather firewood or volunteer for anything. Uh, actually, that wasn't Bennett. That was another guy. I don't even remember his name. He's not on here. The last guy we peered out was Bennett, who he was just super selfish. He was not a good team player. He didn't politic correctly with the squad. He came off as cocky and arrogant and had absolutely nothing to back it up. Most of us at Ranger School uh, thought that we were the baddest dudes on the block because that's just having a type A personality. But those of us who eventually got a tab had some sort of skill or set of skills that made us valuable members of the team. We worked hard when Bennett was squad leader and basically got him his go for him. And most of us were angry when we find out when we found out that he would be advancing to mountains with us. So even though we 
peered him, they still let him go to, to the mountain phase. All right, this next story, which is the last story we're going to go through today, is called Violence of Action. And I know a lot of people have been waiting for stories about an actual ambush lane. And this is what we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about an ambush that we did. All right, now the day before we were supposed to cut, conduct an ambush, Somebody had messed up the ammo count, and we had been given almost 2,000 rounds of Link 762, which is ammunition for the 240 Bravo machine gun. So um, these rounds are really heavy. We got resupplied each day because you're going to use those rounds each day, so there was absolutely no need for that much ammo. At most, we needed about 500 to 700 rounds, so we had well over double what, what, what we needed. I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but we got way too much. The movement that day was particularly difficult. We didn't take trucks. We walked straight from Darby, which meant the way we got to the objective would be the same way we got back. We had to climb some really steep hills and navigate some really thick brush, but we finally got to the ambush point. I and the rest of the machine gun team, we were exhausted from carrying that much ammo. I mean, it is really heavy stuff. We took almost all of it to the ambush site because we were like, we do not want to carry this stuff anymore. In the operations order, the squad leader had, I guess it stupidly told us to fire on cyclic for 30 seconds. So firing on cyclic again for... Uh, my civilian crowd out there, that means when you cyclic for a machine gun means you're holding the trigger down. Now, for most machine guns, you want to hold that trigger down for about three to five seconds. Um, but when you go cyclic, you're holding it down. And I don't think you're supposed to do it for more than like 10 seconds. Um, and when you have a blank firing adapter on your weapon, which is what we had because we're firing blanks, that really messes up the machine gun if you fire it for more than about 10 seconds. We didn't want to carry all that ammo back, however, because the terrain was horrible and there were a lot of hills. But we also didn't want to just throw the ammo away because that's really bad. You don't want to get caught ditching your ammo because that you'd get dropped from the course because it's a big deal. The logical conclusion here was to follow the, the plan that had been briefed, which was to fire on cyclic for 30 seconds. When we were given the signal to open fire, I held on to that trigger, and the 240 just came to life beautifully. It did not jam once. And once I started firing, I started my watch, and I was determined to hold on to that trigger for no less than 30 seconds. When we hit the, when we hit the 30 second mark, I let go of the trigger for about three seconds and then I fired again and I kept firing at a rapid rate until the squad leader ran over to us to tell us to stop firing. I looked at the barrel through my night vision and it was glowing as like super bright, looked like it was on fire. At the end of the machine gun, the blank firing adapter was, was visibly glowing under the night vision and the gun was hot. I opened the feed tray cover and took the rounds out before they cooked off. So I swept them off the feed tray before the, the, the gun was so hot. I was afraid that it was going to cook a round off. So it gets so hot that the, the ammunition would explode before it got fired. And then, so we assaulted through the ambush lane. <clears throat> we assaulted through the op four and we took their weapons and we gathered them up. And we put them in the middle of the road and we wrapped them with our uh, our fake C4. And we put our demolition charge ready. Uh, we put our demolition charge together and we ran back and then we uh, pulled the fuse and then ran away. And then boom, it all it, it blew up. Now, we don't actually blow up the equipment. You set it off. You've set the explosive off to the side, but you simulate blowing up all that equipment. During the after action review, the ranger instructor just said, so violence of action. Holy crap. I thought op four was going to piss their pants, but don't ever fire the 240 like that again. You're going to break it if you haven't already. And the movement back to Darby still sucked, despite the fact that we had burned almost a thousand rounds of that ammo. It mostly sucked because the RI caught on to the fact that Rodney, <laughs> remember Rodney's really good at navigation that Rodney was magically always assigned as the point man. And so he fixed that by telling Rodney to go to the back of the formation. I don't remember who replaced him, but they took forever to navigate. 
with Rodney, we never stopped. <laughs> we just headed right to the objective because he was really good at navigation and we could just go. He never needed to stop. And when the new point man took over, we stopped all the time. Now, one might think that stopping isn't bad because you get to take a break. False. <laughs> stopping sucks because you have to take a knee and you can't take off your rucksack. So when the new point man took over, we would literally be on a knee for 20 minutes at a time. Now, for those of you who have never had to take a knee with an 80 plus pound rucksack, believe me when I tell you that it is sheer torture. But this is just like every other mission. It finally came to an end. We waited outside the cadre building cleaning weapons for hours before they finally released us for our two hours of sleep. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Rangers lead the way.